Well, thanks for giving us some time to talk about my uh, studies. Um, I'm going to talk about the research that I've been doing over the last uh, few years. And I'm going to try and kind of flip it from my usual stance, which is from a design perspective, to try and talk about a lot of things that I don't know about, like economics and things, uh, because my studies have started to kind of move into the area of work, employment, and naturally that kind of fits in with um, some of the topics we've been talking about. I haven't timed this as well, so apologies if I massively overrun or massively underrun. Um, so really the first the starting point for my um, studies in the last few years is to talk about Agile. And Agile is something we've already seen in all the talks. Um, it's the prevailing way that stuff is made in production. And whether you're a lawyer, um, someone who works in healthcare, a politician, agile influences the way that things are done. And the way that I understand agile is that it's not just a way of doing stuff quicker. Um, it's not just a software development methodology. It goes much deeper than that. And I believe that actually Agile represents a fundamental change in the means of production. If you look at when the Industrial Revolution um, took place, the emergence of factories, the division of labour, tables, so the first French factories used a table uh, manufacturing process where, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, so French manufacturing factories used tables, you'd have components, you'd move the components around, you'd fix them together. That's industrial manufacturing. But we work in digital factories now, and rather than having physical components, nuts and bolts and tables, we have burn-down charts and Kanban boards. But essentially, we are using exactly the same method of breaking tasks, work down into small components that monkeys can do. <coughs> and that's an important point because breaking down work so monkeys can do them is how value is maximised, our profit is maximised. And it also means that we can use lower paid people, or monkeys, or anyone, to do this work. So it has quite a big uh, knock-on effect throughout society in terms of how stuff is made, how it's distributed, what people do, whether they're happy at work, and how enterprises operate. What's different from the Industrial Revolution and what we all do is that we are all part of the manufacturing process. We are all the means of production. And this is different from the analogue world where people would propose plans, they would design things, they would propose what might happen in the future, someone else would make it. We would have people in factories, making the trucks, building the houses, but there's a separation between physical goods and their design. What we do today is not the same as the architects and the designers of the past who would offer plans that someone else would make. <clears throat> so agile is an important question for us. It informs how we work, it changes the way that we do things, and even how our social relations at work and in society um, are mediated. It's not just doing stuff quickly, and it's not just a software development tool. And if you wanted to extend that analysis, you could say that Agile represents, embodies neoliberalist ideas and practices in terms of um, making labour um, 
more fluid, more global, and embodying entrepreneurial capitalist ideas in the body of the worker. <clears throat> now, the way that Agile is presented is very much as the rock and roll of software development. It's how you can turn productivity from 10 to 11. Yeah? Agile is the panacea to productivity problems. And if we all buy into it, if we're all on the same, same tune, we can do amazing stuff. The reality is, and we probably all know that, anyone who works in Agile or an enterprise, is that it's a lot messier. What it means is that the reduction of a hierarchical management structure and a division of labour that's been um, managed by scientific methods, removing that removes some of the structure that is good and bad for how people work. And the reality is people have to kind of make it up spontaneously on their own. Can look beautiful, can be a real mess. The problem is that the outputs of Agile are often not too good. And, you know, the notions of technical debt um, and piecemeal incremental change, that all uh, cascade up into, you know, ideas about lean, all come from the same problem, which is in self-governing teams, there is always um, a driver to not risk doing anything that's too visionary, too disruptive, and so we have no progress. This is why often agile enterprises stall for different reasons. I've started to feel less nervous. So, I, I haven't mentioned design yet, which is great. It's a good, it's a good indicator of this presentation. Um, so, agile, it's an important thing. Um, it's maybe coming a bit to its end, perhaps, but at least for the last 10, 20 years, it's the prevailing way that the means of production operate, and it has all of these repercussions in how we tr change organisations. If you change, try to change an organisation or an enterprise that isn't within the agile paradigm, you will fail. If you want to um, create uh, plans for the future and do lots of research and anything that is not working in that scrum uh, way of um, operating, you will fail. Anyway, that's just a bit about the background. So um, what I did in my studies is I done a lot of research into how innovation works in agile environments, particularly in in-house teams. Um, and so I spoke to quite a few people and written a lot of stuff. And um, so I wanted to just to share some of the research um, data that I have around that. So the first thing I looked at in terms of the means of production in Agile is, well, what is the structure of work? What are the kind of things, projects, essentially, that are delivered? And the first kind of project, and these are the fun ones, are at a strategic level. Um, so there is a lot of investment, a lot of interest, a lot of... Um, senior support to do something big. These are the nice Agile projects. The other ones are, and this is interesting when people talk about innovation. Innovation, people tend to think of new features, new products, new services. Actually, in enterprises, innovations can be so small there may be not innovations at all. Uh, it's about tweaking things. It might be changing some words on a website. It might be removing some bug. But a lot of the time, a lot of the work that people spend innovating are in these very small uh, level pieces of work. And then we get to the middle. And the middle is where there's a mess because Without the hierarchical scientific management structure that we had in the bad old days, uh, removing all that and making teams 
uh, autonomous removes all of the scaffolding that helped to structure work, um, not necessarily in a good way, but it helped to avoid some of the problems, challenges that teams have. Um, and it's these middle projects that aren't the really well-resourced ones, and they're not the little ones, it's the ones in the middle where all of the um, struggles within Agile really come to play. Um, and they're the ones that really um, can be a negative experience for people working in them. So really, Agile presents a struggle. And of course, in today's political climate, struggle is a, quite a negative word. Um, the idea that society, people, classes, workers, everyone is involved in a struggle um, is not necessarily seen to be a good thing. Um, and actually, it'd be better if we didn't have problems and we lived in utopia, as we've heard about today. And I'm thinking about retiring, and that's kind of utopia, and I'm really scared about it because I won't have any struggle, I think. Um, so if we go back to you know, the, the materialists in the 19th century, social struggle was actually the opposite. Struggle was the way that society learned. Struggles were the way that we didn't just have purpose, but we changed the world. Struggles are the way that teams in enterprises learn, they collaborate, have camaraderie, they change things. And change is what we're all trying to do here, I think. So, anyway, that's a bit of a on the side of things. So, part, so as well as finding out about the size of projects, um, I also done some diary studies and looked at the kind of occupational experiences that people have in these digital factories. And the interesting thing, coming from an occupational science perspective, sorry, <laughs> I forgot I've got that, um, is that we also work in an information society. So the traditional parameters of what gives people occupational balance and a way to um, succeed and be resilient in work is different because we're using our minds as well as our bodies. So if you look at the classic uh, frameworks for occupational health, um, you know, it's about doing the work. By doing work, we learn. We don't only just make a profit for someone else, um, but we learn, we socialize, it becomes who we are. Talk about purpose, our work is our purpose, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> and it's also about being, it's part of becoming someone in the future that you're not at the moment, um, whether that's an architect or an engineer or a nurse. So it's about the future, it's about a sense of belonging. But what's missing is this knowing part. Um, so, as you see, it's a bit disconnected, this presentation, um, which is kind of intentional. So, we've got this challenge. It's a bit of a mess, um, and it's all new, and we kind of think that actually the conditions of work, the struggles, are helping us to make sense of the world and to change it. We just need to have the kind of balance to be able to thrive and survive through that. So the two things that I've found in my research in terms of teams' success, and I don't mean success in productivity, I mean success in surviving and being happy, is around structure and agency. Now structure, as we've seen, is endemic to how humans work and what they do. We structure things. We saw it in the last presentation, structuring the ambiguity of the future and the work, right? And you can structure forever. It's an endless, infinite structuration of reality, okay? Unfortunately, structure in itself never solves anything. Um, and maybe you can look at history where people have tried to impose structures or people have created their own ones. And work 
structuring fails um, because it doesn't deal with human agency of about how people navigate, grow, and make sense of structures to make purpose for themselves. Um, I think I might deviate here a bit again. Um, so structures that do work, okay? And I haven't mapped them to Milan's book, but I think they do. Um, so the first one, and we've seen this already, if people don't know where they're going, they get lost, right? So you need to have a vision, and ideally some kind of roadmap to do it. Um, this one is in the book. This is the tangible futures, I think, yeah? So giving people the means to be involved in all aspects of work rather than siloing them into a department or a discipline. And this is actually a natural effect of the digital transformation of work that we're seeing anyway. The only problem is, is that the reason that this is happening is to de-skill and to maximise profit rather than to maximise people's well-being. So we need to kind of take control over that. The third one, and this is also a tangible futures, putting stuff that's about the future into the present, seeing how people behave and work with it, um, is anthropology. Who's bought a T-shirt from anthropology? Hands up. Or who's got an anthropology T-shirt on? No? Okay. They do amazing cups. I saw you. Uh, they do amazing cups and glassware, um, but also they're, it's really good. Two minutes. Oh, my gosh. Right, okay. Really good for, um, for, for helping enterprises thrive. Then the last one is design thinking, um, which is a bit of a cliche, but where you can get people to work together creatively to solve things, flattens organisations, people are more bought in, they're happier. So you're going to have to really skip now. So uh, just on the agency side, so it's about how individuals use the structures both to resist and to affect change. Um, and I'll skip over this, which is basically another bit of the research which looked at how people's knowledge uh, relates to this digital environment. <coughs> and interesting, it maps to this structure and resistance. So at the kind of highest level of knowledge, which I've called nous, people are situationally changing things, resisting and developing their own strategies to survive, rather than following them like robots in terms of structure and methodology. Um, so we need a bit of, we need a bit of um, structure, a bit of nous, so that people aren't robots. Um, and then lastly, in the last minute, I guess, I just kind of got into the purpose of this conference, which is about purpose itself. <laughs> and really, for me, and I'm interested, because I don't know about this topic at all, is really, you know, going again back to the 19th century, the idea of progress, social progress. Progress, not built on ideas, but built on changing the means of production how work is done. That's where the value of society comes from. That's where it's generated. That's where the change can happen. Not by clever ideas, but by the people who make the stuff. So for me, progress has a view of the future. It implies structure. It also builds in that resistance. I think it's a more powerful measurable, smart objective, perhaps, than purpose. And if you want to do a little experiment, just let me know if you think that's a crazy idea or what the differences are between uh, progress and purpose. You can tweet me or throw me a bit of paper if you've got any ideas. And just to finally say, out of my studies, these ideas about structure and agency and balancing the two make people happy. Teams, enterprises that have that mixture and that level of autonomy and structure and balance where people aren't monkeys 
but they have a vision to follow, and they know where they're going, they're empowered to do it, have a happiness that is greater than people who aren't. Um, and that's something to celebrate and a reason to have a dance. Thank you.